Hi, it has been a very odd couple of weeks for me as the response to my previous video has been so overwhelming. I did not expect it to reach that many people or have that many people see my face or hear my voice, which is a little scary, but also I am so grateful for the response it has gotten and the amount of people who have commented and liked and subscribed. I think at the time that I'm filming this, there is like 6,000 people subscribed, which is way too large of a number and also one that I can't count on my fingers. So therefore it's not real. Because my last video was about hating books, hating heavy quotations around that, I thought I would talk about books that I love. And also a couple of clarifications about the previous video, just so that I can make a few things clearer. So if you would like to just skip to the book recs and you don't care about what I have to say, the timestamp will be on the screen somewhere. And if you would like to hear me clarify a few things, stay right here. Though I doubt that the people who thought I was calling them sluts and whores in the previous video would want to come back, maybe they are. And if so, thank you for coming back here and hearing me out. Because first and foremost, I would like to clarify that in no way was I trying to shame or belittle the people who read and enjoy romance or smut or fantasy or TikTok books or popular books because I'm also one of the people who reads those books. I'm not gonna sit here, get on a high horse and be a hypocrite and shame those people for enjoying those things when I'm also someone who enjoys those books. It doesn't make sense for me to say that. These books are really popular for a reason. They mean a lot to a lot of different people and I'm also one of those people. I think I should have been a little clearer. Um, I'm editing right now and I realize that you can hear a truck backing up in parts of this and I don't want to subject your ears to that. So what I was saying in this part was that romanticization of very harmful behavior and like borderline abusive behavior is becoming really normal within these genres and when people promote these books and they're not really talking about these things and they're making these books seem really like lighthearted and they're so cutesy but when we romanticize these things we're telling other people that like this is okay and this is fine and this is actually desirable in a partner and that's not something that I want to encourage and this is especially prevalent in really popular romance books like Colleen Hoover. And so it's not the genre itself that is awful and horrible, but a lot of the popular books are romanticizing really harmful things. And my question pertaining to that brief discussion of fantasy and romance and whatnot was one about diversifying reading tastes. And this is a genuine question because we live in a time right now where it is so much easier than it has ever been to access recommendations of different content, literature of different kinds, to just diversify the things that we read. I'm not saying it's incredibly easy to get your hands on any book, but it is easier right now than any other time before. And so if you live in this time right now and you enjoy reading, why wouldn't you want to diversify the books that you read? And this goes for not just anybody who just reads romance or fantasy. Why wouldn't you want to read outside of your scope? You can only find more books that you enjoy if you choose to step outside of your comfort zone. You know, the next five star read that you have may be something of a completely different author or genre or content kind that you might not find the most enjoyable, but you end up reading it and it becomes your favorite book. My argument was more of one for diversifying what you read and expanding your scope so that you can take in different perspectives, but also just benefit yourself as a reader. I know it's idealistic to assume that every reader would want to step outside of their comfort zone, but a girl can dream. But as I also stated in that video, it matters less what you read, but also how you read it. I think enjoyment can exist in tandem with critical thinking. And I've seen some people take my comments in that video as, you should not be reading for enjoyment at all. It should only be deep analysis, philosophical thought, and absolutely no pleasure in the act of reading. I don't think they're mutually exclusive, and I think critical thinking can boost enjoyment, and enjoyment can boost critical thinking. They're not completely divorced from each other in the process of consuming literature. And when I say critical thinking, I don't specifically mean PhD level thesis analysis. I mean just taking a few moments after you read a book, thinking, what did I enjoy about this? What didn't I enjoy about this? What about this made me uncomfortable and why did it make me uncomfortable? Or what about this made me feel joy and why did it make me feel joy? 
what was the author trying to say here? Or how well did the author deliver that message? When you think about the contents of a book, I think it allows you to become a more discerning reader and also figure out what you enjoy in a book so that you can look for it in the next one and take that knowledge with you as you continue to read. Okay, hi, I'm editing again and there's more background noise here. So what I'm saying in this part is that you can find good in things that you would consider overall bad or you can find bad in things that are overall considered good. Critical thinking isn't just for things that you like or things that you dislike. There's nuance in everything and we need to apply critical thinking to things that don't appear that deep and things that do because nothing is exempt from you thinking about it. The examples that I mention in the video are more of like, oh, you enjoy this thing, so you should think about it more. But it's like anything, you know? And I don't think I need to specify that, but I am just putting that out there, just in case. When I say being a hater, I meant that more in the vein of just critical thinking. Critical thinking has a lot of negative connotations around it because of the word critical, but it doesn't have to be all negative. Every piece of literature has nuance and you can find the good and the bad that is essential to critical thinking. It's not just pointing out every single thing that you find wrong with it and hating on it meaninglessly. Because hating on something meaninglessly is also bad faith criticism. It's not actual critical thought. Bad faith criticism, for example, is when somebody watches my video, takes my words and says, you're so right, people who read romance are stupid and we should be reverting back to the classics. Loud, incorrect buzzer sound. Mindlessly hating doesn't get us to a better place than where we are right now in this discourse. And I think we need to really stop with the classics elitism that we see going on when we talk about book talk. If you're somebody who only thinks that books written two centuries ago are worthy of your attention, pick up a book written in the last 20 years and stop bragging about the fact that you read Dostoyevsky. Spell his last name. You can't. Exactly. As I read a lot of articles and saw a lot of people's videos who were critiquing book talk or just hating book talk, it seemed that there was a really extreme point of view to that argument that people who are on book talk are mostly sex depraved idiots who have no concept of thinking about anything at all, which is really wrong and weird and that pains me because then when i critique something about book talk that i don't like people lump me in with that side of people who only hate book talk i do explicitly state a lot about book talk that i enjoy i follow a lot of creators on there who i trust who give me recommendations or have well thought out reviews or are able to utilize critical thought when discussing books and so why wouldn't I want to stay on that platform? I really respect and admire a lot of the people that I've seen on there. I don't think it's right to say that book talk is the enemy in this situation. So in this whole discourse, I hope that we can leave room for nuance, that it's not just black and white, book talk wholly good, book talk wholly bad. When I made that video and I said I blame book talk for this, I guess I should never utilize hyperbole again. Book talk hasn't ruined reading that was never my claim. It was more about the attitude of anti-intellectualism that I've seen rising on certain parts of it. As social media makes it easier to stop thinking, analyzing, and critiquing, I ask that we just push against that. Book talk hasn't caused book bans, but the anti-intellectualism on some parts of it is definitely similar to the anti-intellectualism that results from book bans or fuels book bans. So I think if we claim to care about book talk and the state of literacy right now, we have to be bringing some tangible action to this. I have thought about this a lot because I feel so narcissistic sitting here believing that my opinion matters and then posting it online, believing that my opinion matters enough that other people would also believe it matters. I hope that I would be able to leverage that ability in some way to make things happen. Because as much as we sit on here and argue back and forth with each other on blank screens, what is that really doing in real life? I mean, a big issue with intellectualism is that it doesn't feel translated into the real world. And so I hope that the argument that I'm making in that video would be understood enough that it would cause people to do something about it. Relating to that, 
All proceeds from this video and any other existing video on my channel right now will be donated to the ALA. They're a really great organization that funds a lot of public libraries, gives them grants to expand their collections and fund new programs. There's a bill in my state right now that's currently trying to cut all ties with the ALA, which is extremely disheartening and I want to be able to do as much as I can to help with that. So I would encourage you to once again go look at the resources in the description of that book talk video and do whatever you can, whether it's time, money, or energy, to fight against book bans because if you're a reader and you care about the state of literacy right now, then you should be doing something about book bans. One final thing, thank you for leaving uh, comments and constructive criticism. I really enjoyed reading people's conversations and other opinions and experiences. And it's really encouraging because I don't want this to just be an echo chamber of my own thoughts. I'm a fairly legal adult and I would hope that in a couple years time or however long, I can look back and say, wow, my opinions have become much more substantiated and knowledgeable since I was 18. And my hope is that I would be able to learn and experience more and talk to others and grow and hopefully have my opinions continue to evolve and change. If I wanted to just hear my own thoughts parroted back to me, then I would have gotten a megaphone and sat in a cave. But this is the internet and people are going to voice their opinions and I'm going to hear a lot of different things. So I appreciate that because my video was also talking just about critical thought and, you know, taking in other perspectives. And so it's really nice to see that happening. The one thing that I will ask is that if you do in fact voice an opinion that maybe differs from mine, you just not address me in an extremely derogatory manner. I did in fact cry when I read a comment that called me a slur. So if you are voicing something, maybe please don't start it with like stupid or idiot or bitch or a slur because if you talk to me in a really hostile manner, I'm not going to want to hear you out. So I just ask for like a little bit of respect, like just a tiny bit of human decency. Please continue to discuss things and comment things and hopefully I and many other people will continue to learn. So without further ado, Um, let's talk about books. The way this will work is I'll give you the title, a brief synopsis, why I like this book, and an excerpt from it. And then if you like this book, what other books that you should read. And obviously just because I like these books does not guarantee that you will like these books. So read at your own discretion. Obviously critical thinking skills, consider the context in which these books were written. I shouldn't be telling you how to use critical thinking. All right. I climbed out of my head and watched myself implode a thought without a body ought to be the shot to take a load off my brain is poisoned and I'm searching for the antidote but every time I find it my defense is scream oh no you don't whoa. This is my favorite book of all time and it's a poetry collection. It's called Bright Dead Things by a current U.S. Poet Laureate Ada Limon. And before you say anything, I know that right now the popular perception of poetry is it's two line sentences like Gabby Hanna poems or Rupi Kaur poems. And I'm here to say that this is not that. But I don't think this book is written in a pretentious manner. In fact, it's pretty accessible to most people, I feel like. The language in here isn't extremely highbrow trying to make you feel like you're reading really good poetry because Limon doesn't need to prove that to you because of the way that she writes. It just automatically flows out of her. She's so incisive with her pen in this. This book is so sincere in the way that it writes about emotion and heartbreak and grief and loss. It never feels like Limon is shying away from getting into the nitty gritty of her memories and her feelings. And that's what makes this really stand out for me is that the writing is beautiful, but the emotion is also so strong. I read this first in 2020 and I genuinely have not stopped reading it since. I read it every single year and I always find something new. If you take one book away from this video, it has to be Bright Dead Things. I love this collection so much and I love Ada Limon so much. And if you read this and end up liking it, I think you'll like anything. Obviously by Mary Oliver, the nature imagery in there is very apparent in here. And also Bluets by Maggie Nelson. I don't think I can like properly convey to you how she writes unless I read you something from this. I'll read you my favorite poem of all time. It's called Glow. In the black illegible moment of foolish want, 
There is also a neon sign flashing, the sign above the strip joint where my second big love worked as a bouncer and saved the girls from unwanted hands, unpaid for hands. Thin-lipped ladies with a lot on their minds and more on their backs, loaded for bear. And for the long winter's rain, loaded for real. And I've always been a jealous girl, but when he'd come home with a 4 a.m. stomp in his boots and undressed to bed, he was fully there, fully in the room, my sleeping body made awake, awake. And there was a gentleness to this, a long opening that seemed to join us in the saddest hour. Before now, I don't know if I have ever loved anyone, or if I have ever been loved, but men have been very good to me, have seen my absurd out-of-placeness, my bent grin and uncalled-for loud laugh, and have wanted to love me for it, have been so warm in their wanting that sometimes I wanted to love them too. And I think that must be worth something, that it should be a celebrated thing, that though I have not stood on a mountain under the usual false archway of tradition and chosen one person forever, what I have done is risked everything for that hour, that hour in the black night where one flashing light looks like love I have pulled over my body's car and let myself believe that the dance was only for me, that this gift of a breathing one who wants was always a gift, was the only sign worth stopping for, that the neon glow was a real star, gleaming in its dying, like us all, like us all. What's your favorite romantic comedy? Uh, I have two. It's Notting Hill oh, and um, <laughs> yeah, it's so classic. And uh, more recently, Gone Girl. Right? If you know anything about me, then you all have heard me mention this book at one point in time or another. I think I recommend this book to genuinely every single person who asks me about books. I may be highly predictable, and you might have seen this coming, but it's Gone Girl, obviously. If you have watched the movie. I still encourage you to read this book, and if you somehow have not had the twist spoiled for you, then please read this book because this book is insane. It's crazy. I cannot express to you the amount of times that I've texted somebody, hey, let me know when you get to the twist in this book, and I'll wait for their text to come in, and it'll just immediately be like, oh my god, Alicia, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with this book? Oh my god, what's happening? It's so, so wonderful. So the synopsis of this book is that there's a married couple, Nick and Amy Dunn, and they've been married for five years, and on the morning of their fifth anniversary, Nick leaves the house, and he comes back, and he finds that Amy is disappointed disappeared. But when the police come to investigate, they start thinking that maybe Nick had something to do with it. So this book is told through two perspectives. It's through Amy's diary entries as she chronicles their relationship, and also Nick's perspective as he's trying to go through the investigation without getting arrested for his wife's disappearance. And the one thing that makes this stand out for me among most other thrillers is that Flynn writes this with equal importance on both plot and prose. A lot of the time when I read thrillers, they're very focused on getting from point A to point B, just driving the action forward and there's nothing wrong with that but it just makes this book stand out to me because Flynn has such a cutting way of writing especially when she's characterizing these two people as extremely complex and nuanced individuals. You get so drawn in by her writing that you have no idea who to trust in this book and she also has this really great talent of making Nick Dunn feel like a complete loser to the point where you sympathize with him but you're also like wow you suck like you suck so bad i love the way that she writes this it's witty it's cutting it's intelligent when i say nothing will prepare you for the twist like nothing will prepare you for the twist and the book carries its momentum after a lot of thrillers tend to lose their momentum after they reveal the big like surprise but this book is so incredible in its rhythm. It's relentless. You will finish this in a day. I promise you. It is captivating. If you end up liking this, then obviously you should read all of her other books. I am still waiting for her to come out with another book. It's been so long. Um, but then also I would recommend Big Little Lies because although that's not as like gory crime as this, there's definitely the complex relationship drama that you see in here. Above all, this is fun and I love a fun book, so. I will read you the opening lines of this book. Nick Dunn. When I think of my wife, I always think of her head, the shape of it to begin with. The very first time I saw her, it was the back of the head I saw, and there was something lovely about it, the angles of it, like a shiny hard corn kernel or a riverbed fossil. She had what the Victorians would call a finely shaped head. You could imagine the skull quite easily. 
I'd know her head anywhere. And what's inside it. I think of that too, her mind. Her brain, all those coils, and her thoughts shuttling through those coils like fast, frantic centipedes. Like a child, I picture opening her skull, unspooling her brain and sifting through it, trying to catch and pin down her thoughts. What are you thinking, Amy? The question I've asked most often during our marriage, if not out loud, if not to the person who could answer. I suppose these questions storm cloud over every marriage. What are you thinking? How are you feeling? Who are you? What have we done to each other? What will we do? I tried and I failed. I just I can't. I can't. <laughs> okay. And now I'm going to get a little sentimental because the next book on my list is Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. If you don't know what Little Women is, it's essentially a coming of age novel that follows four sisters, Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy, as they go through childhood, their teenage years, and then into adulthood. And I promise it's a lot more interesting than I'm making it sound because there's so many ups and downs. They're figuring out romance and relationships and sisterhood and life and death. And it's this really beautiful portrait of this family as they go through the years. I love this book because of just how how sentimental it is to me. I read this when I was really really young and I've constantly been rereading it every single year and I find that I've grown up with these characters and every time I revisit it I find something new that I've experienced that I can connect to or another piece of writing where I'm like oh that hits me so much deeper now. This is something that I've seen in a lot of reviews where people will say oh if I had read this when I was younger then it definitely would have hit me more. So I can't say that this will affect you in the same way that I did because I have like a tether with this book. Like this book is a core part of who I am. But just the way that Alcott writes these characters, you can tell that she based it off of her family because there's so much love pouring out of every single page and every single sentence. Even in their worst moments, you never hate these characters because of how endearing they are and how much passion Alcott is pouring into these pages. And just to get this out of the way, I have always been an Amy girl and I will continue to be an Amy girl. And I was an Amy girl before the 2019 version when everybody suddenly liked her again because Florence Pugh played her. Mm -mm, no, I have been here since day one. If you have watched the movie, any of the adaptations, please read this book because there is so much more depth within these pages that just can't properly be conveyed in a movie because of the runtime. This book is pretty long but it's so worth it and when you finish reading you'll either be crying or smiling or both. You feel like ultimately you're walking by these people at the end of the book because of how much you've seen them go through. It's helped me navigate so much grief and loss and ups and downs in my own life and I just cannot express how much I love this book. It's so beautiful. This book just paints such a beautiful picture of what it means to be a sister and a woman and a dreamer and an artist and I just feel so much emotional connection to this book and I hope that you do too. If you like this book then you should read Pride and Prejudice but I will also talk about that book later and Yolk by Mary H.K. Choi and I'll read you the opening lines of this book which I actually think perfectly encapsulates the personalities of every single one of these characters. Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe, lying on the rug. It's so dreadful to be poor, sighed Meg, looking down at her old dress. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have plenty of pretty things and other girls nothing at all, added little Amy with an injured sniff. We've got father and mother and each other, said Beth contentedly from her corner. The four young faces on which the firelight shone brightened at the cheerful words, but darkened again as Joe said sadly, we haven't got father and shall not have him for a long time. She didn't say perhaps never, but each silently added it, thinking of father far away where the fighting was. And what excellent boiled potatoes. Many years since I've had such an exemplary vegetable. I don't think Pride and Prejudice really needs an introduction because this is the blueprint for enemies to lovers. Jane Austen's pen was on fire when she wrote this book. Essentially, this book follows the Bennet family and their mother's plot to try and get their oldest sisters, Elizabeth Bennet and Jane Bennet, married off because they're not in a great place financially. So this book follows Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy as the titular Pride and Prejudice as they navigate their tumultuous relationship and their ups and downs. And I love this book 
a lot obviously because of the romance and because this is just so well written but also because this is a really funny book if you kind of navigate through the older language you realize that Jane Austen is actually really really funny I know women can be funny but Jane Austen does a pretty good job at it and it's also not just a book about romance there's also discussions of class and gender and what it means to be a woman in olden society and how that affects what you do and how you act and honestly this is a pretty feminist novel by all standards especially during that time that austin wrote it in the language is a little more complex but i promise it's so worth it like this book had me like giggling okay i don't giggle at books but this book had me smiling and giggling and blushing which is so embarrassing but it's so fun and it's so beautiful and if you like romance then obviously you should read this. If you like this book then you should obviously read anything else that she's written. Austin is an incredible writer. I would also recommend Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, Atonement by Ian McEwan, and for like modernish books Open Water by Caleb Azuma Nelson is also really good. If you do have recommendations for romance please leave them in the comments because a lot of the books that I've read recently have been hit or miss and I would love to read actually good romance books that don't make me want to cringe, you know? So to close out, I'll read you the book's iconic opening lines. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Read this book and then go watch the Colin Firth adaptation and the Keira Knightley adaptation. My next book is Beloved by Toni Morrison, and this is magical realism. Beloved is the story of this freed enslaved woman. Her name is Setha, and she lives with her daughter Denver in Ohio, in this house that's haunted by her dead baby. The plot really kicks off when Paul D, who was also previously enslaved on the plantation where Setha was, comes to visit Setha and kicks the spirit out of the house. And after this happens, this woman appears on her doorstep, and she calls herself Beloved, which is the word that was written on Setha's baby's tombstone. Setha begins to believe that this woman is actually the reincarnation of her dead baby. And so the story follows her as she tries to navigate this relationship, as Denver tries to navigate this new relationship, and Paul D. The story really rises in tension as Beloved begins to draw them all closer and closer. If you have not read any Toni Morrison, you need to pick this up because she is absolutely one of the most talented writers to ever exist. I read this in AP Lit and I genuinely have not stopped thinking about it since. Every single page, like the prose just tumbles off because of how rich and detailed it is. There's so much heartache and pain in this book, but Morrison describes it all so beautifully. And the book never shies away from any of that trauma and hurt that Paul D and Setha and Denver have experienced. And Morrison makes sure that you feel every single thing that these characters are going through. The pain that they've gone through, the trauma that they're trying to navigate, the guilt that Setha faces. Morrison brings so much commentary on all these different aspects, not only of the racial trauma, but also what it means to be a mother, what it means to be a daughter, and the responsibilities of those roles, and what it means to be free, and to love, and have hope. And this book is so beautiful. It's so beautifully written, but the plot will just suck you in. Morrison is incredible, not just as an author, but also as an activist and a public figure. And I really, really encourage you to go read anything else that she's written and also just look at some of the work that she's done because it's just incredible. And she's such an impressive and inspiring person. And if you end up liking this book, then you should read Kindred by Octavia Butler and Piranesi by Susanna Clarke. I would love more magical realism recommendations as well because I just haven't been able to read a ton in that genre. I'm trying to read A Hundred Years of Solitude right now, but I would also love more book recommendations in that area. For The Passage, I will read you something that I think really displays how strong Morrison's prose is in this story. Paul D. did not answer because she didn't expect or want him to, but he did know what she meant. Listening to the doves in Alfred, Georgia, and having neither the right nor the permission to enjoy it, because in that place mist, doves, sunlight, copper dirt, moon, everything belonged to the men who had the guns. Little men, some of them, big men too, each one of whom he could snap like a twig if he wanted to. Men who knew their manhood lay in their guns and were not even embarrassed by the knowledge that without gunshot, Fox would laugh at them. 
And these men who made even Vixen laugh could, if you let them, stop you from hearing doves or loving moonlight. So you protected yourself and loved small, picked the tiniest stars out of the sky to own, lay down with head twisted in order to see the loved one over the rim of the trench before you slept, stole shy glances at her between the trees at chain up. Grass blades, salamanders, spiders, woodpeckers, beetles, a kingdom of ants, anything bigger wouldn't do. A woman, a child, a brother, a big love like that would split you wide open in Alfred, Georgia. He knew exactly what she meant, to get to a place where you could love anything you chose, not to need permission for desire. Well now, that was freedom. It, it, the, it, flame, flames, flames on the side of my face. My next book is And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. This was my favorite mystery for a while. Agatha Christie is known as the queen of mystery for a reason because every single book is so twisty and complex. But when you go back and you reread the book, you're like, wow, how did I not realize this? It was so obvious from all these different clues that she's left. This book is probably her most well-known and it follows this band of people as they go onto this island they've all been invited there by some mysterious figure and once they get on this island they realize that they're trapped there and somebody is killing each of them off one by one so they have to figure out who the killer is while trying to escape and trying to interrogate why they're even on this island in the first place and what has brought them all together this book is really well written because not only does it grab your attention because somebody's dying in every single chapter but also Christy manages to bring in a lot of different aspects of morality and what it means to carry out justice what good and bad means for different people it's a book that's really thrilling but it also manages to interrogate a lot of complex themes the twist is one of the best in literary history and i'm not exaggerating it's so well written. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that the title of this book was very racist and the rhyme in the book was also very racist and it's obviously written in a separate time. Just please keep that in mind when you read because I think it becomes pretty obvious as you're flipping through that this was not written in the 21st century. Christy is an incredible writer though and she also like disappeared for 11 days once. Just like fully left society and nobody saw her or heard from her which is like kind of crazy um but if you like this book then you should obviously read anything else that she's written she has so many books for you to choose from and i would also suggest sherlock holmes obviously and for more modern mysteries i would say the seven and a half deaths of evelyn hardcastle and i'll read you the first line of this book in the corner of a first-class smoking carriage, Mr. Justice Wargrave, lately retired from the bench, puffed at a cigar and ran an interested eye through the political news in the Times. This opening sentence tells you absolutely nothing, so if you would like to know what happens, then read this book. This book is Played As It Lays by Joan Didion, and it follows actress Mariah Wyeth in Los Angeles and it chronicles the ups and downs of her life as she struggles with a lot of mental illness and drug related issues. Didion writes a lot about the grittier side of Los Angeles and she paints it with a lot less of a glamorous and glitzy tone and she makes sure that you know how depressing and miserable it is to live in Los Angeles at this time and to work in Hollywood. This book first and foremost is not a fun time okay you will not be smiling and giggling throughout this. This is like pretty somber and depressing. Didion writes a lot about the darker side of Hollywood and I know it's really popular right now to like expose these industries but Didion was one of the first to write about it in such an honest and painstaking portrayal. It's very nihilistic in its tone. Mariah always wanders through all of these situations. There's very little agency on her part to kind of seek out help or treatment for anything because this is just kind of her normal state. We watch her struggle through all of these issues like infidelity and abortions and mental health and addiction and there's just so much pain within these pages but Didion is so raw and honest about it that you can't help but sympathize with Mariah. Even as she's going through all these events and she feels so helpless, Didion's writing just sucks you into her life and I love this book so much just because of all the different things it made me feel and her writing throughout. Once again, sad as hell! 
but so worth it i think even if you don't enjoy the very little plot that it has I think you'll enjoy the way that Didion just writes about all of these different settings because so much of it is painted in this imagery that somehow makes gray and dull and lifeless feel exciting. I love the way that she writes this book and I love the way that she writes Mariah. And I'll read you a little passage that I feel like describes Mariah pretty well. She began to feel the pressure of the Hoover Dam there on the desert, began to feel the pressure and pull of the water. When the pressure got great enough, she drove out there. All that day, she felt the power surging through her own body. All day, she was faint with vertigo, sunk in a world where great power grids converged. Throbbing lines plunged finally into the shallow canyon below the dam's face. Elevators like coffins dropped into the bowels of the earth itself. With a guide and a handful of children, Mariah walked through the chambers, stared at the turbines in the vast flittering gallery, at the deep still water with the hidden intakes sucking all the while, even as she watched clung to the railings, leaned out, stood finally on a platform over the pipe that carried the river beneath the dam. The platform quivered. Her ears roared. She wanted to stay in the dam, lie on the great pipe itself, but reticence saved her from asking. Once again, there's not a lot I can do to make this like, hooray, like, oh my god, this book is so fun. Like, it's really not. You have to read sad books sometimes, and this is just unparalleled. It's so dumb. Oh, it's so dumb, it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb! Next book is a children's book, and it's The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin. The synopsis of this book is kind of like Knives Out, where you have this eclectic cast of characters, they're all gathered into one place, some dead guy reads out his will, and then they have to kind of piece together the will to try and figure out who's getting the fortune because this guy's like a billionaire. There's a lot of different like word puzzles and little clues and hints everywhere. It's really clever, but it's also really funny. And our main character, her name is Turtle, she's this kind of enigmatic little girl who solves all these riddles and tries to figure out what's going on. I love this book because of just how many twists it has and how many bits and pieces you have to put together to try and solve the mystery. And when I read it as a kid, I realized for the first time that maybe like a child can be smart. I don't know if that makes sense, but when I read it, I was like, oh wait, I can be like turtle and I can use my brain and I can put pieces together and I can help people. And so she was kind of my blueprint. Once again, this is a children's book. So if you're an adult, I don't know if you're gonna like love it, but as a child, I really did. I also analyzed this a while back, like the elements of class within this book, and it's pretty well thought out for a children's book. If you like this, then obviously Mysterious Benedict Society and the Penderwicks. Those are just staples, and they also made me feel really smart as a kid. So I'll read you the opening lines. The sun sets in the west, just about everyone knows that, but sunset towers faced east. Strange. Sunset towers faced east and had no towers. This glittery, glassy apartment house stood alone on the Lake Michigan shore five stories high. Five empty stories high. Then one day, it happened to be the 4th of July, a most uncommon looking delivery boy rode around town slipping letters under the doors of the chosen tenants-to-be. The letters were signed Barney Northrup. The delivery boy was 62 years old, and there was no such person as Barney Northrup. I know it is possible to achieve justice without fully dehumanizing the victim, and that's what we need to figure out. I'm not exaggerating when I say that this is my favorite memoir of all time. It is just an incredible piece of work. Most people have either seen the cover or heard of the case that this book is about. This book is written by Chanel Miller and she was Jane Doe in the Brock Turner Stanford case. If you don't know, remember what that is, it's when Brock Turner, who was a student at Stanford, assaulted a girl behind a dumpster and then got six months for assaulting her. Six months. Miller is writing about her experience, about her experience with the courts and with the trials and her life in between all of those different events. And it paints such a beautiful picture of who she is because 
One thing that she emphasizes throughout this book is how much the court seeks to dehumanize any victim, how much it strips them down and makes them only the person who was allegedly a victim of this assault. Miller really seeks to humanize herself, to show you the good and the bad and how she lived as a daughter and as a sister, as an artist, as a student, as somebody who is not just a victim but also a person in and of herself and that she doesn't want to be simply labeled with that moniker of victim or survivor. I can't express to you how much I love this book. I sobbed when I finished reading it. If you have the time, please go and look at her victim statement that she read. It's somewhere on YouTube. I'll have it linked below. But it's so powerful to hear those words coming from her own mouth. She never tries to mute the feelings that she's experienced through this entire court case and the anger and hurt that she's gone through. But there's also a note of hope and joy and peace throughout this. The way she writes is so poignant and it will hit you so hard. I can't properly express how much this book means to me. Just reading through it and empathizing with her and relating with her and seeing all these different snippets of her life, these tender moments that she clung on to, even in the midst of all this terrible media and the hopelessness within this court case. It also gives you a really in-depth look at what a trial is like for essay victims and how tiring that process is and how unfair that court system is. I so desperately encourage you to go read this. If you like this book then you should read Seeing Ghosts by Kat Chow and Educated by Tara Westover. I'll read you one of my favorite passages. I wrote this book because the world can be harsh and terrible and often unforgiving. I wrote because there were times I did not feel like living. I wrote because the court system is slow as a snail and victims are forced to spend so much time fighting rather than spending their days creating, drawing, cooking. I wrote to expose the brutality of entitlement, gender violence, and class privilege in our society. But I would be failing you if you walked away from this book untouched by humanity without seeing what I saw. Those thousands of handwritten letters, the green-lipped fish at the bottom of the ocean, the winking court reporter, all the small miracles that sustain me. We may spend half our time wandering around, wondering what we're even doing here, why it's worth the effort, but living is an incredible thing. Just to have been here, to have felt, if only briefly, the volume and depth of others' empathy. I wrote, most of all, to tell you I have seen how good the world could be. My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshfag is a staple TikTok book and the face of modern sad girl literature everywhere. You have seen this painting, you have seen this cover before, I guarantee you. A lot of people say this is overrated or overhyped. That's not the book's fault, okay? Sorry. Um, because I really like this book. This book follows our unnamed protagonist who is a rich, affluent white woman in New York as she's attempting to sleep for an entire year. If it sounds boring, you'd be right. This is one woman's journey to taking so many pills that she conks out for 365 days and you follow her as she's trying to get those pills, as she's navigating her dying relationships, as she's slowly escaping society and retreating into this cavern that she's created for herself. It is, once again, sad and depressing, like play it as it lays. This book sort of relaxes into a state of plotting, dull malaise. It's very slow and I get that I'm not selling this well, but I think if you read the book, you understand why it's told this way. I feel like this book does a good job of interrogating privilege and the luxury of rest, how capitalism has turned it into a privilege, and how existing under these systems sucks the life out of you. And any joy that you feel in your daily life when you're going through these cyclical motions, I think Moshfag does a really good job of writing the book in a way that it imparts that feeling onto you if you aren't already feeling it. Because of the way that she writes these plotting day-to-day -day moments, how she makes you hate this main character, and how you feel like nothing is happening. It's all on purpose 
and I really love the way that she writes this book. Our main character is an absolutely horrible person. She neglects all of her relationships, all of her responsibilities, does not care about a single other person, lies to get drugs, all the, you know, like fun, cool girl stuff. But throughout this book, you still feel a connection to her. Even though she's like, awful and despicable and unlikable you still care for her she discussed facets of her personal life in a really detached manner but what you do get to see of her you feel sorry for her and it's a really interesting character study it's a really interesting book about a really weird concept but i really loved it and i really loved the writing and the lack of plot and the characters the bit at the end if you have read the book you know what i'm talking about that really threw me off, but I love this book. If you like this book, then you should read I'm Thinking of Ending Things by Ian Reid, or The Idiot by Elif Bachman, or Severance by Ling Ma, and I'll read you a little passage. But by the end of May, I sensed that I was going to grow restless soon. A prediction. The sound of tires on the wet pavement. A window was open so I could hear it. The sweet smell of spring crept in. The world was out there still, but I hadn't looked at it in months. It was too much to consider it all, stretching out, a circular planet covered in creatures and things growing, all of it spinning slowly on an axis created by what? Some freak accident? It seemed implausible. The world could be flat just as easily as it could be round. Who could prove anything? In time, I would understand, I told myself. We are not vultures. We are crows. And that makes more sense with context. This is my favorite YA book for a variety of reasons, but I think this book truly has it all. There's action, there's romance, there's magic and fantasy, but there's also the aspects of complex relationships and what trauma does to you and how when you're living in a world that requires you to have no morals, how far are you willing to go? This book follows a group, the Crows, there's six of them, as they attempt to pull off a heist in order to secure various different things that all of the team members want. It follows them as they plan this heist, they try to pull it off, and the subsequent consequences. It's part of a duology, so there's Six of Crows and then Crooked Kingdom. These books destroyed me when I read them. I was sobbing at the end of them, it hurt me so much. I think I've emphasized this for every single book, but the writing is so striking within this, especially for a YA book. There's a lot of nuance in these pages and a lot to analyze and a lot to sink your teeth into, and the way that Bardugo writes these different characters, how they all have distinctly different personalities and attitudes and morals, which is incredibly difficult to write six distinct people and not have them kind of mesh into one. I love the way that she's characterized these people and how their personalities influence all these different events, how they drive the plot forward. There's never a moment where I'm like waiting for something to happen by accident so that it pushes the plot forward. And there's good romance in this, okay? I've come to find out that I like romance more as a subplot than an actual plot. This book does it so well. Oh my god. Enemy Still Lovers actually happens in this book. None of that wishy-washy co-workers one-sided rivalry thing that I've seen a lot. No, this is actual enemies to lovers. These two people hate each other, okay? But that's besides the point. I love this book series. There's just so much depth within these pages that I don't see a lot from very popular YA books. Six of Crows is far better than Shadow and Bone, both the TV series and the book series. Do yourself a favor and read this. And after you do, if you like it, read This Is How You Lose the Time War and A Magic Steeped in Poison. And I'll read you the opening line. Juiced had two problems, the moon and his mustache. The opening line, once again, does not tell you anything about this book, so pick it up and you'll see. Do you guys ever think about dying? I don't know why I just said that. The next book is Everyone in This Room Will Someday Be Dead by Emily Austin, and the plot of this is essentially our main character, Gilda, is a lesbian atheist, and she ends up going to a Catholic church to seek therapy. But when she gets there, they mistake her for applying for the receptionist job, and she ends up becoming the receptionist at this Catholic church. So now she has to figure out a way to keep this job 
lie to these people while also figuring out her mental health and her depression and why she even needs to continue living. It deals with a lot of heavy subjects but not in the way that a super depressing book would. It feels like it needs this element of lightheartedness in order to combat the very somber topics that it's discussing. It's really sarcastic and biting but it's also really sincere in the message that it's trying to deliver. This is actually a pretty recent read for me. I read it last year in a bookstore and I ended up crying at the end of it. And I don't cry easily at books but this one hit me so deeply. The way it's written from first person perspective and you get this deep dive into all of Gilda's thoughts and experiences and questioning why she's on this planet, it hits you so much harder as you see her struggle through all these lies, try to maintain this job because she feels like she has no other purpose. It's always cloaked in this very funny, lighthearted manner but when you get to the bottom of it, you realize, oh, this is a person who's actually hurting so much and she has no other way to express it or reach out to anyone. I love the way that she writes about depression, the way that she writes about struggles with mental illness because it feels so real. It's never just like, oh, LOL, like sobbed myself to sleep or whatever. It gets into the parts of depression that really hurt and deeply affect you and your behavior and paralyze you and stop you from getting help. It's just so honest but also so funny and I think that is a beautiful combination. If you like this book then you should read Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason and Writers and Lovers by Lily King. Here's one of my favorite passages from this book. Imposter syndrome is a psychological pattern in which individuals doubt themselves and have a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. Last year my friend Ingrid told me I had it. I had just told her that I didn't feel like I belonged at my previous bookstore job. I told her that I didn't really get 1984 and that I hate poetry, so I wasn't sure if working at a bookstore was right for me. She told me, you have a classic case of imposter syndrome. I told her that I'm not sure that's a real syndrome. I said, I wonder if everyone's an imposter. What if beneath every lawyer's suit and every stay-at-home parent's apron, everyone is just a baby who doesn't know what they're doing? I wonder if anyone really identifies as the adult they've morphed into. I remember being 16 and feeling 11. I remember thinking, how could I be a teenager? I remember finishing high school and thinking, am I grown now? Is this what it feels like? I feel the same as I did before. I think I am an imposter. 27 years ago, I was a baby. Before that, I was a clump of cells. Before that, I didn't exist. How could I be a bookstore clerk, or a Catholic, or a woman, or a person at all? I'm a life force contained in the deformed body of a baby. Of course I'm a fraud. The fact that I'm able to carry myself through life without being crushed beneath the psychological weight of being alive proves that I'm a con artist. Aren't we all con artists? Last but certainly not least, Life on Mars by Tracy K. Smith. Tracy K. Smith was a former US Poet Laureate and this collection is just impeccable. It's full of poems that are rich with description and life and one thing that I really love about this is that it combines two worlds that seem kind of divorced from each other, literature and science. A lot of this book focuses on sci-fi and space because her father worked with NASA and she grew up in this environment that was just surrounded by space and so she discusses a lot of that within this book and she discusses her relationship with her father, all these different feelings and all these different experiences and it's such a tender portrait of this man in science and woman in literature and it just combines these two in such a beautiful way. I really love this book, one, because I grew up near a space center and I would go to it pretty often and so I feel an intimate connection with the Hubble telescope, but also just because of how beautiful the language in this book is. There's so many poems where her words feel like they're dancing off the page. The rhythms and the sounds flow through your ears like music and that's what I love in a lot of poetry is that it feels like music. Please go listen to her read poetry because I can't do it justice. It's so lyrical and thumping and there's such a deep pace within it that drives every single poem forward. The subject matter within is as impactful as the words themselves. I know I'm being really vague but there's so much within this book that you just have to read to figure out what's in it 
If you like this, then you should read Time is a Mother by Ocean Vuong, Sweet Dark by Savannah Brown, and The World Keeps Ending and the World Goes On by Franny Choi. I'll read you an excerpt of my favorite poem within this collection called My God, It's Full of Stars, and I'll read you the last part. Five. When my father worked on the Hubble telescope, he said they operated like surgeons, scrubbed and sheathed in papery green, the room a clean cold, a bright white. He'd read Leary Niven at home and drink scotch on the rocks, his eyes exhausted and pink. These were the Reagan years, where we lived with our finger on the button and struggled to view our enemies as children. My father spent whole seasons bowing before the oracle eye, hungry for what it would find. His face lit up whenever anyone asked, and his arms would rise as if he were weightless, perfectly at ease in the never-ending night of space. On the ground, we tied postcards to balloons for peace. Prince Charles married Lady Di. Rock Hudson died. We learned new words for things. The decade changed. The first few pictures came back blurred, and I felt ashamed for all the cheerful engineers, my father and his tribe. The second time, the optics jibed. We saw to the edge of all there is, so brutal and alive it seemed to comprehend us back. Like, if you don't think that's good, then I don't know what to tell you. To close this out, I do have some honorable mentions of books that I also really love but just did not have the time to talk about in this video because it's already an hour long. But those books are The Book of Delights by Ross Gay, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vuong, Franny and Zoe by J.D. Salinger, Pachinko by Min Jin Lee, Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner, In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado, Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu, House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, and American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin by Terence Hayes. I feel like I said a whole lot of nothing through this entire video, so I'm sorry if you gained nothing from this, but I hope that you'll take at least one book away from this. I will have links to all of the book's Goodreads in the description below if you would like to see other people's opinions about these books. But my biggest piece of advice is that you get these books at your local library, and if you can't get them there, then buy secondhand. I think we just need to be increasingly conscious about where we buy our books from, who we are giving our money to, and it's always a good idea to support your local libraries. And I hope the beginning also helped clarify a few things. I think that's the last I'll say about that video, but as always, reading is a privilege and a power and inherently political, so I believe that we should all continue to critically think about our books and to use our voices and to apply the things that we've learned in real life. So that's all from me, and hopefully I will see you in another video soon. All right.